Hi everybody and welcome back to Funding a Better Future. This is a series of bite-sized episodes that feature the expert insights of climate tech investors. My name's Cherry, I'm the founder of Above and Beyond Recruitment. Our business partners with climate tech startups and we help them to scale and grow their businesses, either by recruiting for them and helping them to build out their teams or by offering them talent advisory and consulting services. This series is aimed at founders and leaders of climate tech businesses, and particularly to anybody that's looking to raise investment this year. Throughout the course of the series, we're hoping to have given you a realistic picture of the current investment market, some tips to give you the best chances of fundraising success, and hopefully a network of people that you can approach when the time is right for you. Today is our penultimate episode of the series, and I'm joined by Kate Ronane from Longwall Venture Partners. Longwall focuses on three key areas, health, resilience and sustainability. And Kate is an investment director focused on supporting early stage deep tech startups, specifically within physical sciences. Some of their investments in the sustainability space have included companies in photovoltaics, monitoring methane emissions and vertical farming. And I'm really excited about today's episode because I feel a lot of the investors we've spoken to across this series so far have been focused more on the software side of climate tech or where technology is acting as a facilitator or enabler to decarbonisation. So I'm really excited to talk to Kate today, who's firmly focused on those deep tech solutions. So, Kate, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Cherry. And... I wondered if you could kick off, I mean, I've given a bit of an intro to, to Longwall and to yourself there, but to kind of give us a bit more info, I, I suppose, on, on Longwall Venture Partners, the, the types of companies you invest in, the stage you get involved at. Yeah, G give, us a, give us a bit more context as to what you do. OK, so um, as Cherry mentioned, we are a deep tech startup, uh, a deep tech fund. So we, we define deep tech very much as, I guess, science based technology startups. So. We look for opportunities where there's um, a really exciting new piece of technology, piece of science that can address one of the big challenges that we see facing us and um, uh, of which sustainability is, is one area where we were really excited to try and make an impact. Um, we like to work at a very early stage. So when there's a um, some proof of technology, say in a, in a lab environment, um, but to actually help founders to um, think through where this could be applied. Um, lots of the types of businesses we get involved with are, have, a, have a platform technology. And then part of what we bring is helping to think through where are the markets? What are the challenges that this can really address and how do we get there? So um, a, lot of, a lot of our work is, is on that commercialization piece and building up the case. Um, and yeah, we tend to we tend to be first investors, uh, first institutional money into the companies that we invest in. So it really gives us an opportunity to get up close and personal with the teams early on and bring the experience that we've got of building businesses in this area to bear on on their particular venture. That's brilliant. And, and that that kind of helping with that go to market, and that commercialization piece is so important, isn't it? Because often people will have a fantastic innovation, um, but it's about really understanding how they can position that to, to make it commercially successful. And you mentioned um, we, when we were chatting just before we went live, actually, about, about some of the support you give those companies post investment outside of just the commercialization bit, but kind of getting involved from an advisory perspective on 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 the running of the business. Tell us a bit more about what you do on that side of things. Yeah, I mean, because we invest really early, often teams are not complete. Um, and and that's something that we're quite reasonably comfortable with, actually, that, um, you know, that the early stage team will have gaps or, or will want to attract people with experience in a particular area. But of course, you can't wait until you've got, um, I don't know, a, um, a very experienced uh, business development person to start making sales. You might have opportunities that come up earlier. So part of what we do is is bring our experience and um, our operational experience to bear. So we will we will sit alongside the team and help them through some of those um, critical, but perhaps a little bit unfamiliar or tricky things initially. So we, we we quite often will step in, usually into a commercial role if there's if that's where there's a gap for a short period of time to just help the team, um, you know, do these things for the first time for a lot of 
a lot of founders, particularly founders with an academic or a science background, there's an awful lot to learn. Um, and, and that's somewhere that we can give actually really practical help. Um, and that's, and it's quite fun to do as well. And it helps to really get to uh, know the teams in a, in a completely different way than if you're just turning up for board meetings every six weeks or so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. And, um, what, what's your op opinion of the funding landscape been this year? Cause it's a, I, I found from throughout the course of this series, you know, undoubtedly from macroeconomically, we've got a, a you know, a slightly choppy waters. Um, but definitely when it's kind of looked at through a climate lens, a lot of the investors that I've been speaking to have remained quite confident and quite buoyant about what the climate tech space looks like this year and moving forward. What's what's your opinion of, of the landscape this year? Yeah, I think I think it's it, it really is. Um quite varied depending on the sector. I mean, overall, obviously, there's been some quite big macroeconomic things that are that are impacting absolutely everything. We are a we're a generalist investor. So as you mentioned, you know, about a third of our portfolio is in um, health or um, resilience. So that that includes maybe some more engineering based startups. And we're definitely seeing bigger impacts there than we are on the climate side. I think um, I think for some other areas, so um, things like quantum, for example, there's perhaps a little bit of a correction that got very frothy for a while. And um, so that that those are the areas where we're seeing big corrections um, and mm. things are perhaps returning to um, something that's a bit more reflective of the technology maturity <laughs> um, than, than it was at one point. But for, on the climate side, I think that is possibly the most vibrant um, and we're seeing lots of lots of new funds coming into the space. Um, we're seeing a lot of corporate funds actually. Um, this is an area that's really key to them. So I, I think a lot of CVCs are still really active in this but in, in the climate tech space. Uh, so it's it's a it's not a bad time to be fundraising in climate, but everything has slowed down. I think the bar is is being set higher in terms of what investors, how mature investors want the, at least the thinking to be, if not the technology. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not easy, but then it's never easy to fundraise. It's always, it's always a challenge. Um, but I think climate is probably one of the better areas at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and what, what parts of that, I mean, climate of Obviously, being quite a broad, broad church, and I appreciate your focus is predominantly on that deep tech side. But are there particular areas within climate tech that you're most excited about this year that you think have got the greatest potential? Yeah, uh, it's a good question, actually. I mean, as, as you mentioned, we're very much a, a hardware focused investor. Um, we we think that you can't solve all the problems in the world with software. Um, and actually, there's plenty of people who are supporting some really innovative and cool software initiatives to try and help us deal with the challenges. But actually, we need new technologies as well. Um, yeah. I think we're starting to see that there's more. Um, so, so for me, anything that's got you know strong hardware elements always going to be interesting because that's that's what I'm passionate about. Um, I I've seen some really nice things starting to emerge where people are looking at big established industries and, and thinking quite creatively about not just what their piece of technology can do, but how that fits into that bigger picture. And I think that's a kind of a key for hardware in particular or something that's materials based. You've mm. got to really understand not just your part, but actually what else needs to happen or what needs to change in in um, further down the value chain in order for your technology to make that impact and to, and to truly um, have, make a difference. So um, I think there's you know there's some there's some really innovative stuff um, uh, that's looking at. We have a we have an investee company that's looking at um, additive manufacturing, but a much lower energy path to it. So things that are perhaps a little bit less obvious that you know uh, aren't I don't know um, a new battery which you know battery technology there's mm. obviously been lots of and lots of really cool initiatives um, but actually uh, something that's a manufacturing process that's really widely used that has the potential to disrupt across lots of sectors and give those 
savings in terms of resource and energy. Uh, those are the sorts of businesses that I think are really exciting and interesting. And, and hopefully we're starting to see more and more initiatives in that in that space. Yeah. So, so like ones where the climate play isn't quite as obvious or, you know, for up front, but through improving efficiencies, changing processes, one of the byproducts of that is a reduction in energy usage and therefore emissions. Yeah. So, so where you're seeing um, energy and resources as well, I think, as you know, so, so looking creatively at um, incumbent manufacturing technologies and trying to disrupt those, I think that's quite, quite an interesting space. Um, yeah. as, as well as, uh, you know, we see it as well in, in chemical processes. So companies that are looking to um, uh, take, you know, reactions that are run on industrial scale for, for decades with really high, uh, really energy hungry processes and actually trying to, to significantly reduce the, the carbon footprint of those sorts of um, activities. I think there's some really exciting opportunities in there that sit alongside all of the great innovations that we see that are more, I guess, what people would typically think of as, as climate tech or as um, as green tech. But I think you need both, right? You need to we need to fix the um, energy consumption uh, part of the piece as well as um, you know in, innovations in how we generate energy. Yeah, absolutely. It's that like greenfield innovation, things that we've never been doing before versus how we can improve things we're already doing and make them better and, and smarter and yeah, cleaner. Amazing. OK. And and the investors that are the, the companies that come to you for investment. So as you said before, you get involved right at that really, really early stage. So seed and onwards. Um, I'm assuming can kind of come to you maybe slightly green to the process of fundraising, even slightly green to to, you know, commercials and, and the startup world. So what advice would you give to founders at that very early stage of their journey who are looking perhaps to raise for the first time ever, to whom this whole world is completely brand new? What advice would, would you give them about how to approach the fundraising process and perhaps what pre-work and what thinking they maybe need to do before starting those conversations? Yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good question. So you're right, we talk to lots of people who are really early on in their in their fundraising journey. Um, one of the things that I always suggest that people do is, you know, don't don't assume venture is the right route for you and your business. There are lots of ways to fund a business um, and venture capital really uh, comes higher up the list than it probably ought to. Um, you know, the, the best way to fund a business is always through revenue. That's not always possible, but it, it, it is it is definitely the case that that venture shouldn't be the first thing that you think of. Um, I think definitely do your homework on on the um, investors that you are approaching, and that's understanding their investment thesis. You know what, for example, we we invest early, so don't. There's no point in approaching me with something that's Series B that's had lots of investment. That's that's just not going to be a fit for our fund, no matter how great an, an opportunity it is. So really understanding. Um, you know, if somebody's a specialist climate tech investor, don't go to them with a healthcare um, startup. So I think that trying to understand what the interests of your funder are is really important. And I think ask loads of questions and listen. Um, always ask people if they've got money or if they're actually actively investing and make sure that um, you don't, you know, you, you listen hard for the answer because it's not always the case that people are in investing mode. Um, uh, and I think the, it's worth spending time trying to understand what success looks like for your investor really early on, because if you want to exit the business for, I don't know, 10 million pounds in three years time, for most venture investors, that's not going to be a success. That's not going to be an attractive exit. They're going to want you to work on it for longer and exit at a much higher um, uh, at a much higher price. So you you don't really want some you don't want that difference of interest on the cap table. So I think that's that's really important um, to establish really early on in the discussions. Um, you know, ask it's it's not just you asking them for some uh, asking investors for something. You've also got to make sure that the right investors for you. You can't really fire your shareholders. It's it's quite tricky. Um, but in terms of what you can then, so once you've done that homework, you've established this could be a good fit. Um, you know, even talk to people that they've invested in. I think the thing that really impresses 
for, for me from an early stage is people who've kind of thought through, um, who've talked to customers. Um, I can't I can't overstate how good it is to get customer feedback, and who've really thought through what their positioning is, what 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 their um, what their actual value proposition is. So not telling me that um, I don't know that uh, CO two emissions from internal combustion engines are are a big problem if what they're selling is a um, is a material for a battery anode, um, then you know the, the car market is relevant, but it's not your market. So trying to understand the difference between the very big numbers of, of the of the overall problem and actually where you contribute and where you fit in. Really clear thinking around that is is always something that's really impressive and irrespective of sector, I think is something that investors, if they can see that um, that understanding and that spark, then it doesn't matter if there's gaps elsewhere. You you can help people fill in the gaps, but if they can see where they're going really clearly, that's that's always a, a good indicator of a business that we'll want to spend more time getting to know. Absolutely. So that like clear focus on this is the part of the market that we want that we're addressing. This is the problem we're solving for them, and and having a like a realistic pos, pos, a realistic understanding of what that addressable market really is, rather than like overstating it, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing worse than saying this is, you know, a hundred billion problem. And if we get one percent of the market, I mean, that's that tends to be quite a turn off. Bottom yeah. up numbers are always much more believable as well. So that really clear understanding of yeah, what you bring to the party and who you need to be successful for you to be successful. So what needs to change for people to adopt your technology? That's that's also um that's really important to understand really early on because that's an area that particularly for deep tech for hardware startups we can you know if you get that wrong it's very costly to have to reiterate and it takes time right. and it, it can be the hill that things die on so does that tend to be more where you're integrating something into another physical machine that may be not ready for it to be integrated in yet so what what other systems need to change to make yeah it, viable, it, you mean or it, it, it can be that or it can be that the market needs to change. So often, you know, if you've, if you've got a, a better widget, um, that do all the other things that sit around that need to change in order for someone to get the performance enhancement from, from your bit? Or it might be what, what, um, what, cha what cu changes do your customers need to make for them to be able to take advantage of this? So um, right. uh I think that's very much where it is. we invest in B2B, not B2C. So that where you sit in the in the supply chain and value chain is really quite critical in understanding in understanding the business and plotting the course over you know what you do with that critical seed and series A investment as well um, to make the most of, of that opportunity. Yeah. So that yeah. clarity and early on is really good. Yeah. Okay. And and in terms of sort of length of time before these companies are profitable might not be the right word to use, but kind of gaining strong commercial traction because you're getting involved at that really, really early stage where something's maybe a spin out from a university coming straight out of the lab. I imagine there's a lot of work to do. And perhaps this is why a lot of investment companies, you know, shy away from deep tech, but there's a lot of investment required to get something to a point where it's ready to be out there and be gaining revenue so what what does that kind of time lag look like for you I know it's going to vary obviously from company to company but, yeah. but generally what would a good like time period be do you think on a return yeah it really it really does vary um I mean we so so for us um I suppose we think maybe more time to exit and that's right. often sort of eight to twelve years um right. from from um first investment to exit for for our businesses which is quite a long time, requires a lot of patience. Um, it's another reason why you really need to make sure that you want to work with your investors because they're going to be around for quite a while. Um, but we we do try and encourage um, all of our portfolio companies to look at early revenue streams. So while they may not get to profitability quickly because it takes a while to iterate and build a product, are the things that you can do with lead customers and early adopters um, where you're getting some revenue, you know, where you're, where you're, um, this might be some sort of like development contracts, non-recurrent engineering fees, 
it, it can be looking at around things like exclusivity, you know, just depends on the on the sector. But can you can you get some um, financial value out of some of those critical partnerships earlier, which just gives a little bit more. Um, sometimes companies can get to break even through that route. It depends on um, how how you know how the rest of the business works um, and what their working capital requirements are. Um, but we you know we would we definitely encourage people to to start trying to um, get. You know, I talked about revenue as being a really important, a really good way to fund your business, and thinking of of your funding in in the round. So, a lot of people concentrate on investment round, equity rounds as funding their business, but actually, it should be a mix of revenue, grants, equity, whatever other funding sources you can lay your hands on, um, and seeing revenue as part of what helps you get you know, make that progress and make that progress more quickly um, yeah. is, is really important. So we, we try to encourage people as early as possible to get into that uh, to that mode with customers. It, it, it also a little bit validates, you know, are we talking to the right people in the companies? Are these people who've got budget sign off who who are going to then be able to take what we're building for them or building with them and take that forward and integrate it? It's, it's quite a useful validation, I guess, of, of you know, particularly if you're working with big companies and it's a bit opaque. Um, mm. you've got somebody who can put some money into working with you and can show you what that pathway to adoption looks like. It's a very powerful validation of the, of, of the business plan that the startup has. Fantastic. So things like sort of paid pilots and things like that would, would count. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and increasingly, um, you know, if things are business critical, we're seeing that, a, a, certainly a lot of large companies that's part of what they can bring to it they can bring expertise but they can also bring some some money to help support um companies through that which is yeah. really really useful actually um it's a good it's a good habit to get into as early as possible it was something that I, I worked for a startup when I was a student and that was one of the things that the CEO said to me that you know they they were encouraged to get into the habit of um uh, of of getting revenue really early on and you know I can definitely see that it it transforms the business and it's 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 a good discipline yeah fantastic that's really useful Kate thank you so much um so thank you Kate for for sharing all those insights today really really appreciate it we are so nearly at the end of this series now only one more episode to go um so if you've missed any of our previous episodes throughout this series and there have been nine previous episodes please go back and have a listen um you can access them through my LinkedIn profile um or on the above and beyond YouTube channel uh, we've shared the insights of some absolutely brilliant people across climate tech investment, including Systemic Capital, Nesta, Planet A Ventures, and many, many more. And next week, seeing us out will be Pooja Balachanda, head of the Venture Launchpad for Carbon 13. So until then, thank you so much to Kate for joining me today. Thank you to everybody for listening and have a lovely week. I'll see you on Friday.